The story of the North American Ford Granada starts all the way back in the 1960s with the Humble Falcon. Falcon would prove surprisingly popular. The combination of style and sophistication was a revelation in the expanding automotive compact market. Options such as power steering and an all-transistor AM radio offered true luxury in an economical package. The coupe body style was particularly handsome and played a role in lifting Falcon to ever greater heights of popularity, particularly with the youth market for which it was marketed. Maverick would arrive in 1970 to replace Falcon and would prove massively successful with over a half million units sold in its first year. A sleek Coke bottle shape disguised the fact that the Maverick was an evolution of Falcon. This, of course, helped save costs and kept prices low. Regardless of the trim level chosen, interiors were generally well equipped, and the two-door was reasonably roomy despite its wheelbase of only 103 inches, which was nearly six inches shorter than the four-door. Granada would appear for the 1975 model year, and would continue the evolution the Maverick had started. The story was of luxury and a greatly reduced footprint that would rival the best offerings from the US and Europe. Ford's comparison of the Granada to the Mercedes-Benz 280 is a legendary tell, a rather dubious tell known by most even to this day. In reality, Ford knew this was a bit of a stretch, but convincing the American public that a smaller car could be just as luxurious as the traditional American barges of past would be a monumental effort. Granada would have to appear different, regardless of the bones on which it was based. Despite great energy and economic uncertainties, the American people were reluctant to let go of their 20-foot-long fortresses of solitude, which shielded them from the harsh realities of the time. So comparisons to the best of the best were made. Right from the start, Granada was presented as an elegantly downsized solution to America's transportation needs. From six layers of rust protection to lifeguard design safety features, many aspects of Granada were covered in great detail in Ford's brochures. A great deal of effort was also invested into convincing prospective buyers that Granada was precision-sized, not downsized. The standard 200 cubic inch 6 didn't exactly advance Granada's luxury reputation, but the available 250 cubic inch 6, as well as the 302 and 351 V8 offerings, did offer a bit more power and prestige. But this is, of course, all in the context of this most melees of times. The vast range of luxury and appearance features made Granada a hit. And as before, there was a driving force behind this great automotive success story. Years before Iacocca was saving Chrysler, he was saving Ford. Again. Lee Iacocca and his team saw the future was not bright for traditional full-size American luxury, so he insisted that Granada would feature styling and content that went far beyond anything previously offered in such a mainstream, downsized American automobile. And he didn't stop with the Ford brand. Mercury would offer an even more luxurious variant. Yes, before there was Versailles, there was the Monarch. Though only superficially enhanced over Granada, Monarch did offer a compelling product for the traditional Lincoln buyer. Exteriors featured even more bright work and enhanced detail. The grill and turn signals were distinct, and the hood ornament was probably the largest ever offered on a car of this size. It was during this time that twilight was nearing for the traditional full-size American luxury car. It is for this reason that Monarch and Granada were designed from the start to offer unusual amounts of luxury and sophistication. And while Ford did somewhat succeed in this mission, there is no denying that the Lincolns of this great era were truly something the likes of which have never been seen since they departed. Developing a new automotive concept is a bit like running a YouTube channel. 
feedback will vary widely from you've achieved perfection to you're destroying humanity as we know it. The hope is to offer something that makes a connection, that fills a need. It is a truly daunting task, but one that is very much worthwhile, eventually. Granado would prove from the start to be one of those worthwhile efforts. The combination of formal upright styling and vast range of comfort and convenience features made it a major sell success. The Ghia trim level in particular personified the spirit of Granada. Color coordinated vinyl roofs and body sign moldings gave the exterior a truly upscale appearance. Other ornate details such as bright picture frame door moldings and intricate well accoutrements furthered the luxury aesthetic. Even more luxurious was the Ghia trim level interior. Door cards featured Rolls-Royce-esque upper faux wood trim that was surprisingly convincing. Floating pillow style seating surfaces and a digital clock combined with available ultra soft leather to outclass most rivals in Granada's price range, foreign or domestic. Once again, there was cause for celebration. Ford had the right car at the right time. In addition to a generous array of standard features, what set Granada apart was the available options. Higher trim levels offered over 100 pounds of sound insulation and remote control rear view mirrors. The public and rivals would stand up and take notice. Granada was truly something special. Before there was Versailles, there was Monarch. Introduced alongside Granada, Monarch offered a higher level of standard features and detailing. Some would say Monarch was just another cynical offering designed by a U.S. car company that had grown complacent and lazy. But it is clear that some effort was made to provide a small level of distinction to this badge-engineered offering. The front end in particular was distinguishable from Granada with its vertical waterfall grille and cartoonishly oversized hood ornament. Monarch was clearly intended to further the fairy tale luxury connection to the best of the European offerings. As with Granada, Monarch offered the luxurious Ghia trim level. Mercury continued to emphasize its offering was precision sized, not downsized, thank you very much. The 250 cubic inch 6 was described as precision cast. Radial tires and disc brakes did provide greater road fill and handling than other offerings at the time. Lower trim levels also focused on luxury and economy. Five passenger accommodations with generous headroom impressed both the press and the buying public. Granada and Monarch did arrive at a time when advertisers were rapidly moving away from the concept of more inches sells more cars. Ford trimmed unnecessary front and rear overhang and wheelbase while keeping the passenger compartment relatively the same size as larger offerings. As the brochure proclaimed, never before has Lincoln Mercury offered a bigger, more luxurious choice of options. It was clear by its second model year, Granada was a sell success. The effort to distill large car handling and comfort into a smaller package proved popular among younger buyers in particular. A form of economy was also on offer with the standard 200 cubic inch 6 and manual transmission delivering 22 miles per gallon city and 30 miles per gallon highway. Of course, these numbers were drastically reduced when V8 power and the vast array of luxury and convenience items were piled on. This four-door sedan features an interior trimmed in silver blue vinyl, one of many color choices and combinations that were available. Kia continued for 1976 with even more luxury detailing inside and out. The two-door was labeled a sedan, which is probably a more accurate description than coupe, as the two and four-door models actually shared identical wheelbase and overall length. On display here is a four-door Ghia model in silver metallic with optional casman cloth nylon knit interior. Assist straps and map pockets on the front seat backs were standard with Ghia. The luxury decor option featured bucket seats and a sporty console with storage and an armrest. The sport sedan model toned down the wood grain accents for the interior and added heavy duty suspension components. 
Available power ranged from the standard 200 cubic inch 6 to the 351 V8. Granada saw a few changes for 1977, primarily because sales remained very strong. In only a few short years, Ford had proven that it was possible to successfully downsize from the massive land yachts of the past. Marketing a mainstream blue-collar nameplate with a vast array of profit-adding luxury and convenience gadgets helped to minimize the impact of Ford's bottom line, as Lincoln cells would undoubtedly be cannibalized. Times have certainly changed, but there is no denying Granada's groovy style, which is a world away from today's automotive offerings. From the proud upright chrome grille and headlamp buckets, to the padded vinyl roof emblazoned with the Ghia badge, the 70s were personified in Granada. The Granada Ghia two-door sedan was described by the brochure as a jewel with a jaunty look, and who could argue with that? The sports coupe continued with new color and trim options. A black leather wrapped steering wheel and louvered opera windows made this the sporty coupe to be in for 1977. This view of the Ghia sedan's interior, trimmed in dark jade touring cloth, seems a world away from today's somber interiors. Optional bucket seats were available on all Granada models and were described as similar to those found in European sports sedan. Other Granada interiors were less lavish, but just as colorful. And as with previous years, it was easy to add on the economy sapping pounds with a truly dizzying array of options. A luxury decor option group featured parts straight out of the Lincoln parts bin, including the upgraded wood tone accented steering wheel and illuminated visor vanity mirrors. Automatic temperature control and four-wheel power disc brakes were luxury options rarely seen on any car in Granada's price class. Granada was a new generation of car for a new generation of buyer. Monarch for 1977 continued to move slightly more upscale with revised color and trim options. Mercury would continue to try to distinguish Monarch from its plebeian siblings by touting its debonair precision size and appearance. The Mercury division did invest effort into further smoothing out the bumps with a program christened Wright Engineer. They were so proud of these efforts they announced them on the dash mounted badge in most Mercury models during this era. As illustrated here, Access to the two-door's rear seats was made quite easy due to incredibly long doors. Brochure literature also continued to focus on sophistication and refinement. Inside and out, Monarch was a step above both Granada and many rivals from GM and Chrysler. Monarch offered a surprisingly sporty image when the correct selection of option boxes was ticked. The S option included Landau vinyl roof, tape stripes, rocker moldings, dual remote control racing mirrors, and styled steel wheels. Indeed, the key word often used in Monarch's marketing was versatile. A car that by day was luxurious and pampering, the perfect upstanding citizen, if you will. But by night, was a sporty companion that could get into all kinds of shenanigans. Luxury door panels were soft and supple to the touch. Lower panels featured carpet that was as luxurious as anything on offer at the time. Yes, Monarch when properly equipped could be that perfect companion to far off flights of adventure. Available reclining bucket seats provided a chance to relax and enjoy some well-earned R&R. 
Slight improvements to the dash and glove box design kept the overall aesthetic of previous years. Continuous efforts to reduce noise, vibration, and harshness were made and would eventually include robots that were generally considered more precise in placing strategic welds. Introducing a new 1978 Ford Granada, the ESS. Can you tell it from this impressive $20,000 Mercedes 280 SE? Granada. Mercedes. Granada. Mercedes. Granada. Mercedes. The new Ford Granada ESS. See how close you can come to the look of a $20,000 Mercedes at the price of a Granada. When America needs a better idea, Ford puts it on wheels. The big news for 1978 was a restyled front end featuring the latest craze, rectangular headlights. An ESS model attempted to further push the point that Granada was just like Mercedes, only cheaper. The Ghia models continued into 1978 as did the two and four door sedan body styles. New two-tone paint and wheel trim options were the only other major exterior changes. The ESS model featured a prominent fender badge and blacked out trim which Ford somehow felt made the Granada more European in nature, though this likely was also a cost-cutting measure as sales were starting to decline. Lower trim levels continued to serve as a basis for customization in an effort to dazzle the widest audience possible. Ghia interior door panels were revised and featured a single broad vertical wood tone accent, which did away with the upper horizontal piece. Fabrics and sew patterns were also revised, and in some ways seemed to be cost reduced. There was no reduction in profit generating comfort and convenience features, however, the highlight of which was the new Quadrasonic 8 track radio developed by Ford Aerospace. The optional 5 liter V8 was still available, as were heavy duty groups for electrical and suspension components. Now, in its fifth model year, the first generation Granada was still packing a significant blow to the competition, but it was clear change was on the horizon. Glitzy marketing and dubious comparisons to Mercedes could only distract for so long from the ever-increasing concerns caused by economic factors as well as the emergence of serious foreign rivals. Not to mention the fact Granada was based on the now truly ancient bones of the early 60s era Falcon. Monarch would also ditch the round headlamps for rectangular units that featured turn signals of a slightly different design than Granada. The ESS option package was carried over from the Granada, relatively unchanged. Again, the effort was to make that European connection. The buying public, of course, saw right through this marketing, and most chose Ghia or base model trim levels. Interior colors and wood tone detailing continued to echo the aesthetics of the late 70s. The 250 cubic inch 6 remained standard on Monarch, as were still belted radial tires and a flight bench seat with center armrest. This example is featured in the ever enchanting shade referred to as Antique Cream. Interesting to note here is the brochure's mention of Corinthian vinyl, something that would no doubt have greatly perturbed Ricardo Montalban. This ESS model, with its odd juxtaposition of blacked out and bright trim, was never a huge hit and is particularly a rare sight today. More oddness persists on this page of the brochure, with a description of the seat material as chainmail vinyl. Nearing its final year, Monarch would soldier on as the odd one out. Its sibling, the Lincoln Versailles, was finally given the appearance and substance of a true Lincoln. As a result, Monarch today is largely forgotten. It is another example of haphazard badge engineering. However, it is for this very reason I would love to have one of these orphaned, badge-engineered time capsules. After all, as I like to say, there are no bad cars, only bad ideas. A car is not responsible for its inherent faults, and a car of this era may be barely able to drag itself down the road. But this is the charm, to recapture another time, perfect or not.
What was once seen as a trim, downsized offering was now a relic. New rivals from GM were arriving with front-wheel drive and greatly reduced curb weights, and Ford knew Granada was woefully inadequate. Part of the problem was the ancient 1960s era configuration. It had been heavily altered over the years to meet ever-increasing safety requirements. The continuous addition of structural reinforcements was inefficient compared to the clean sheet design of offerings such as Ford's own Fox body. And of course, by now it was clear. No one was mistaking a Granada for a Mercedes, no matter how much black paint was slathered on the window sills. One must not forget, however, the significant role Granada played in the success of the Ford Motor Company of the 70s. It was a better idea at just the right time. It is at this point in our journey that we will bump up the lights, as a childhood favorite used to say. While I was cobbling this little video together, I received word that my father had suffered a major stroke and was in serious condition. We take so much for granted, and this was a wake-up call, to keep those we love and those things that remind us of them always in our hearts and minds, regardless of what is going on in our everyday lives. Many have asked, why do I focus so much on these crummy little cars from the worst era in automotive history? The fact is, these are the cars that connect me to a past that I cherish. A past that includes parents, grandparents, and yes, as a lifelong auto enthusiast, the cars I associate with those loved ones. I've never had a loved one that owned a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. There is no personal connection. But the Granada in particular does have a significant place in my heart, as it is the first car I have memory of. My parents may have brought me home in my dad's beloved Ford Falcon, but it was the family's Ford Granada that truly sparked a lifelong love of all things on four wheels. The fact that I was working on this Granada video at this time, it was just meant to be. Thank you, Dad, for passing on the lifelong passion of cars and Mel Brooks movies, of which we have revisited many times during your road to recovery over these past weeks. It has truly been an honor. Thank you, Mom, for putting up with our shenanigans.
suspension very weak Engine fire, the arrow again Smoking dope with John DeLorean Lightning quicker than the planes in Kenosha Dope first gone off What it's like to be at the top 